Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first live webinar discussing the correlation between art and critical thinking in the classrooms. My name is Inga Urbancic McKenney, and here, along with my colleague, Dr. Andrea Todd, we are going to be talking to you today about utilizing some tips and strategies for incorporating this in our classroom. We both work here at the Virginia Tech Language and Culture Institute right outside of Washington, DC. And the reason that we are offering this live and free webinar today and this training for all of you is that we have noticed time and time again that when we have international students who are arriving here to us to study in the US, we find that critical thinking is one component that is lacking um, in their success here in our university system. Uh, so as a result of that, we have very much been focused on incorporating these skills in the classroom, not only here with our students when they arrive. However, we're also helping or hoping to help you um, in Pakistan while you're working with your English teachers uh, and your English students to help them develop these skills before they are studying in the university system, either in Pakistan or if they're going abroad to Australia or the US or England. So this is basically the purpose behind it. And again, we um, are so grateful to be here today. We're so happy that you're here joining us. And we do hope that you um, do ask us questions along the way if you have comments. Also at the end, we will have an opportunity for additional questions and comments along with our information that we'll be giving you if you need to contact us after. So without further ado, uh, we will be starting our presentation. So if you just give me a second while we get this up. So when we're starting here, the main question is, what is critical thinking? So what is critical thinking? So critical thinking essentially is the ability to analyze information objectively and to make a reasoned judgment. Critical thinking allows us to evaluate all sources, everything that all the information that we have on a certain topic, we look at the data, the facts, observable phenomena and research findings. And we also find that people who are good critical thinkers can draw reasonable conclusions from a set of information. And they can also discriminate between information that is more or less useful to help them solve problems or make decisions. So overall, this is kind of the basis of what critical thinking is. And this is one of the key foundations of the, um, of, of the type of thought that is utilized in the American education system. So that brings us to the question, again, of why is critical thinking important in today's society? If you're not gonna be studying or your students will not be studying abroad, why is this important? Well, incorporating critical thinking is important because when we do, we become more open-minded. So by becoming more open-minded, what we're doing is we're just understanding that there is more than one point of view. We're also becoming more analytical so we're creating more analytical thinkers, people who are able to see a problem and actually analyze the problem and not just accept it with a yes or a no. They're able to analyze the problem with the situation. Likewise, critical thinking is very important because it creates learners who are more systematic and inquisitive, meaning that it gives us an opportunity to be able to ask questions about a problem or uh, something that is um, a situation, which asking these questions will result in higher level thought. Finally, critical thinking helps us become judicious and truth-seeking. So by that, what we're saying is that 
the more we ask questions, the more we're analyzing the situation, the more that we're understanding that there's more than one point of view, it actually helps us to uncover the truth. It provides us finally with a confidence in the reasoning. So your students by incorporating critical thinking skills are developing a confidence in their opinion or their a confidence in the full scope and thought, understanding that there are indeed multiple points of view. However, they're able to defend their own side um, while understanding the, um, the ideas from the other, uh, the other situation. So if we take a look and we see why we have critical thinking in the classroom, we can see that students need to develop thinking skills in general. Oftentimes what we'll find in the school systems or what we see when students come here to study with us from other countries, sometimes what we see is that the students are very good at um, repeating what we are teaching them. They're very good at memorizing. They're very good at um, restating our thoughts or our ideas. And what ends up happening is that when we actually have them here in our classroom, we end up challenging them and we ask them why, why do they think this way? And many times they're not sure of that answer. They're maybe only sure of that because they were told that that is the answer or that that's what they had studied in the past. So what happens is that once they come here to us in the US, we are questioning them and we are having them explain and defend their rationale even if it is different from that of the professor. That's another big point to understand that the student through critical thinking and through their thinking skills is actually able to and is encouraged to have their own opinion, even if that is different from that of myself as the professor um, or of their classmates, they are entitled to have that opinion as long as they're able to defend that. So when we take a look at critical thinking in the classroom, first of all, they need to be able to develop those thinking skills. They need to feel the confidence to use those skills. So they have to have the confidence to use them and the tools to understand how to use them and have the motivation to engage in the thinking. So they can't just sit back and say, well, that's how it always was, or, oh, that's what I was told. They actually have to be motivated in order to own their own thought, their own independent thought, and to be able to be, a, to, be able to express their opinions um, and be heard. So if we take a look for a minute just at some research and background on this, we have, you may have seen this before, this is called Bloom's Taxonomy of Higher Level Thinking. And this is essentially a six stage process in which students and people are learning um, and are creating the, the building blocks, let's say, to get up to higher level thought. So when we take a look at something like this, we're starting at the basic, at the basic building block, which the purple block here, is just to remember. So in other words, if we're taking a look and you're thinking about your classroom, and perhaps you are teaching vocabulary, so you're teaching new vocabulary words on, or verbs on uh, whatever it might be, the first thing that you're teaching the students is to actually remember the word. So when they learn a new word, the student has to remember the word. They have to remember how to say it. They have to remember that it's actually now a part of their vocabulary, even if they can't do anything else with it. This is the basic and the, and the basic building block of getting us up to critical and higher level thinking is just remembering and understanding. After that, we come up to the understanding level. So the student, once they remember the word, they have to get to the point where they begin to actually understand what it means. 
So a student, if a student only knows how to say a word, but they don't understand what it means, that's not going to help them at all. So you can see and you know that in your classroom, you're using these stages already of Bloom's taxonomy, starting with remembering, understanding. Next, what we're doing in that level, if we go back to the vocabulary exercise, is that we take a look and they start to apply what they've learned. So they actually will use the word in speaking or they use it in a writing sentence. So they're applying that vocabulary word into their, um, into their daily rhetoric in the classroom. Okay, now, if you'd like to use the vocabulary example, you continue on in your classroom, you're gonna have them analyze the word. So if this is a new word, let's say it's a verb, okay? How can you make the verb present tense, past tense? How do we make it present progressive? How do we make it past progressive? How do we do a perfect tense? What is the difference in the meaning? What are other words that we use that are similar to this word? What is the root of this word? In English, I work with my students all the time showing them that many of our English words actually have Latin and Greek roots to them. So if they understand and analyze the word and they see a Latin or a Greek root, it actually can help them understand the meaning of the word and the connections. And as we continue on, they can start to evaluate how can they use the word? Is that word, how can they use this word to express their idea? Is this word strong enough to support their idea? Is this giving the right tone? They're evaluating how that word can be implemented. And lastly, as we get up to create, this is now where they are at the highest level of thinking, of critical thinking. So if you're doing this in your classroom, you're doing great. So once they start creating, perhaps they're using this word to create a poem. Perhaps they're creating new words from this word. Perhaps they're creating something that did not exist before in relation to this word or the meaning. So this is now where we have a level of critical thinking, which can be implemented in our classroom, which you very well are perhaps already doing and not aware of when you're looking at vocabulary. If, for example, you're currently doing vocabulary and you're stopping perhaps at the application stage, maybe you're, you're teaching them the vocabulary, they're memorizing it, they understand the meaning and they write it in a sentence, maybe that's as far as you're going. But you can see that from there, you can continue on with your building blocks, go three more steps, analyze, evaluate, create, and you're basically um, providing higher levels of thought. So today, we were specifically going to be talking about how uh, we can practically use art in the classroom to develop critical thinking skills. So when we take a look at this and we see art and we're relating that to those six stages of Bloom's taxonomy, okay, we can take a look here and we can see that as we take, if you just imagine you have a painting or a picture in your classroom that you're showing the students, okay? When you get to the first stage, the remember stage, at this point, you're just having the students observe and just describe what do they see, basic facts, nothing crazy. What do you see in this picture that you're remembering at that point? Okay, then we can get up to the next stage of understanding and we can ask them why. Let's reason with evidence. Okay, so you see something in this Monet painting, in this um, impressionistic painting that looks like a tree. Why, why do you think that that is a tree? Give us your reasoning behind that, okay? Maybe they'll look and they'll say, well, it's a little bit abstract, but there is some brown at the bottom with some branches. So, okay, so that does, that could be a tree. Now let's move on to application. If we're applying, okay, if we're getting up to the application stage while we're looking at that painting, we can take a look and we have them question and investigate more well, what do you think about this? Or why, why do you think that that is a tree? What's happening there? We can analyze, we can compare and connect. What do you think about um, this painting in relation to the time period? What was happening in history during that time? Why do you think the artist was creating something like this? 
okay? We continue to move on through Bloom's taxonomy as we get up to evaluation. We can explore different viewpoints. So Dr. Todd and I may be looking at the same painting, but we actually have very different viewpoints. So at this point, we can share our different points of view and our different opinions to see and say, wow, you know what? I never saw that. I never saw that piece in the art. And finally, the last stage and the highest level of critical thinking is when they would start to create. So based on this art um, idea, they would be finding complexity. So they look at a deeper level into the painting. They can create their own painting, which perhaps expresses the same emotion, the same idea, um, something like this, but that it would be creating something that was not there. So you can see just very generally, as we take a look at how we can initiate this through art, very um, basically, you can see from beginning the beginning stages of just observing and describing what they're seeing all the way up to the sixth stage of creation, where they're now starting to actually create their own masterpiece, let's say. This is how we can guide our students through um, art. So just to further, and then soon I'm going to be turning it over to Dr. Todd, and she will be giving you another very practical application. But just so that you see the importance of using art as a teaching tool, okay? First of all, art is very complex, okay? Art has, there's a lot going on when you look at a piece of art. Even if it's modern art that just has one blue stripe across the page, that still, once you start looking at it, can have a certain level of complexity to it. Art also allows for multiple viewpoints. So whatever I see and I feel when I look at that piece of art can be totally unique and different from what you see and you feel. So my feelings and my emotions and what I'm seeing when I see that painting are completely valid and they are mine. I'm able to see that and just as you're able to see yours, which could be completely different from mine. We're seeing different things, multiple, multiple viewpoints. The art is also evoking feelings through the senses. So when you see art, so even if you have um, students in your classroom who are perhaps more shy, they're not as verbal, um, <clears throat> they may not participate as much in class. Well, when you have a piece of art, depending on what type of art you use, you will see that actually we do, we can get a emotional feeling by looking at the art. And sometimes students are more apt to express themselves if they're feeling some kind of emotion. So for example, if you show them a painting that is very, very happy and exciting, then you know what? They're gonna get those feelings of excitement when they're looking at the painting and actually participate in the class by letting us know what they are. Art is also able to be used across all disciplines. It doesn't matter um, what subjects, what culture, what language. If you have the, like here, we have students from all around the world, all different cultures, all different languages, but we can all look at art and have our own viewpoint. And finally, art can be appreciated by everyone. So there's nothing that is saying, oh, I need to be more advanced in this, or I need to be able to understand it. No, any age, any level can look at a picture and have an idea or an opinion. So the last piece that I'm gonna be talking about is artful thinking. So what is artful thinking? So artful thinking is using art to develop creative, um, critical thinking skills in the minds of your students. And the main point is that with artful thinking, there are no right answers. Everybody's answer is valid. So with artful thinking, um, you are able to ask open-ended questions to your students. You know, why do you think that? What, what do you imagine? What could happen with this painting? What do you think that, where do you think that man is going? What do you think, uh, why do you think that they drew the sky purple? 
You know, you can ask open-ended questions in order to get their ideas. Also, it creates a habit of thinking. So in other words, if you're using this technique in your classroom kind of on a regular basis, what ends up happening is that your students start to question more things in their daily life. So if you are teaching them something else and they maybe don't understand that viewpoint or that opinion, or they're out on the street or they see something they might not um, agree with or understand whatever it might be, it actually starts to create that habit of thinking and asking questions. Well, why, why is it like this? Okay, um, what about, what if I did this or what if this happened? So it actually helps the more you're using this in the classroom, the more it helps your students actually create this habit of thinking. And finally, it gives your learners what we're calling an agency and voice over their own learning. So what this means here is that um, your students may have, they are, our students are so smart. Our students are so smart and the only limits that they have at this point is their language. So sometimes when we're taking a look at this and we're trying to incorporate more thoughts, more critical thinking, when you put up a piece of art, it actually gives the students an ability to express themselves and their feelings and their emotions in a way that is safe, it's, um, it's defined, it's structured in this way. So it actually can help them rather uh, compared to if we just said, um, tell me why you think this or something and they have nothing to look at it might be more intimidating to them just to be able to give an opinion on something that's abstract or just an idea. However, when you're starting this process, if they're actually looking at something and they're able to give their idea on that and incorporate critical thinking in that way, this is actually helping your students to express their voice and start this process of critical thinking. So, at this point, I uh, am kind of wrapping up here on the background and the importance of critical thinking. I'm hoping that this at least helped you to get a little bit of a um, understanding of why um, this is important in the classroom and kind of exactly what it is and what is happening when you're working with your students and the opportunities that you have every day with your students to develop these skills to help them um, in really a more global society as they're doing their education and things like this. So we are going to, um, I'm gonna actually be turning this over now to Dr. Todd. She's gonna be giving you a very, very practical implication or application, excuse me, that you can use immediately in your classrooms next week. Um, and um, we, I do see that there are a couple of questions uh, as soon as she's finished with her section, we're going to be coming back and addressing questions as well. So do please keep them coming to us. You can keep sending them along um, and we will do our best to um, figure out how to <laughs> how to use this through the webinar to address everybody's questions. But we do want you to uh, keep sending them. So at this point, I'm turning it over to Dr. Todd and thank you again. Good morning, everyone. And as Inga said, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, it's morning here. It's nighttime in some parts of the world. So thank you for extending your day just to spend some time with us. Um, I think for me, the, the connection with art, not just for the ESL classroom, but in any classroom, the compelling pieces are authentic communication, and the fact that there are multiple correct answers. I'm sure all of you have had the experience in your classroom where you ask, uh, what is the date that of independence for our country? And there's only one right answer. And there's always one or two kids who get their hands up more quickly than everybody else. And they say the right answer and everybody else in the classroom sits in the back and does not feel engaged. With art, everybody can feel engaged. And as Inga said, there are no right answers. This 
is, is wonderful. And it also gives us a reason to have authentic communication because we have something to talk about with facts, the way that we normally teach, um, there's a, a right answer and a wrong answer. And once the right answer is out there, there's nothing to talk about really. So we are going to do a practical application this morning or this evening with you. And I hope that you will all participate. So the first um, part of this is designing a creative question. So at the beginning, we are going to um, look at this exercise that will encourage critical thinking and independent thought among your students, and it can be used in other ways. So first of all, you would select an artwork that suits the routine. You really can use any kind of artwork. Um, we've used multiple kinds in our classrooms. In some instances, the students themselves can choose the artwork. Um, and, and that really even engages them further because they get to pick a piece of art that's special to them. You might want to even rotate and have students pick out uh, pieces of artwork that they, um, that they would like to share. So the first step is the students look slowly before questioning. So normally, you know, when, when you look at art, if you go to the museum, I won't say normally, but a lot of people, you work, walk into the big art museum and there's so much to see. And so you just walk past pretty quickly or you stop for a second. You don't really, really look. So this slow looking and careful looking is the first step. Um, the next step is to collect and document questions but you want your students to generate the questions. Usually as instructors, we ask the questions and the students answer the questions. This, in this case, the students will be creating questions. And then the teacher's job is to summarize the themes that come out of the different questions that have been created. So um, let's start with the slow and careful looking, which is the first step. So the students will study the details and discuss the art in this way. And this will result in authentic communication, as I mentioned before. Students have something to talk about now. And of course, in a second language classroom, this is ideal because you need a subject to talk about. And we're all kind of tired of uh, your favorite food, right? Um, we utilize descriptive vocabulary. I've been amazed to see how second language learners branch away from this is good, this is bad, this is pretty, and, and utilize some other vocabulary because they're trying to find just the right word to describe their feelings about the painting. Okay, so we're going to also have them share their interpretations and perspectives on the artwork. Again, this is, um, this is individual. It, uh, there's no right answer. Practice critical thinking. Uh, we'll show you how uh, when we get into the, the practical exercise, how you will do that. Make good judgments to make a good judgment, you have to back yourself up with facts or with impressions that can support your, your judgment. We can't just throw out there, this is what the artist was doing because we really don't know. We are going to assume because we are going to look for evidence. And then we can share multiple solutions among the class and you will find that small differences can produce large effects. So to encourage artful thinking, these are the thinking routines. You see, which are factual observations, students will look at the painting and they will describe facts that they can see in the painting. Then they will think about it 
concepts, feelings, ideas. Um, I see this certain picture and we're going to look at a picture together in a few minutes. How does it, what do you feel about this painting? What evidence do you have to think that, for example, this person is happy or sad or um, this person is rich or poor, for example, you have to look in the painting and you have to find evidence to back up your ideas. And this is where critical thinking comes in. And then the higher level step, again, we are looking at it from a point of view of Bloom's taxonomy, wonder. Now we're going to wonder what, where, when, who, how, and why are WH questions this gets you to thinking at the next stage and become creative yourself and for your students to become creative too, of course. So creative question starters. These are uh, where we would have the students brainstorm three questions about the work of art when they reach this point. Uh, and we will have these slides available for you. So I don't want to belabor the point, but we have um, why. Why did the artist choose this subject? Can we connect it to what was going on historically at the time? How, what are some how questions that you can ask? How did the painter make that effect? The painter made the effect of light shining. How did he do that? What are the reasons? What are the reasons for the people all gathered around looking at this one point in the painting? What is the purpose? What was the purpose of painting this painting? Was it just to show how people lived at that time? Was it to express anger? Was it to uh, record history. How would it be different if? This is probably one of my favorite questions because typically when I've ever looked at art, I didn't use this. And it's, it's such a compelling question. If you say, how would it be different if the artist had not included the, the house in this picture? Or how would it be different if the painter had been living in the 21st century instead of the 19th century. And along with that, suppose that this is kind of the really creative and imaginative ideas that can come out where you're actually changing what is in the piece of artwork in your mind. What if, what if we knew, what if we knew where the painter was painting this painting? What if we knew what stage of his career he was in? Would this help us understand the painting better? And what would change if? And again, it's on that same order of actually thinking about ways to change the painting or the piece of artwork. So, this is a painting that you and I are going to look at right now. It's called Four Lane Road, and the artist's name is Edward Hopper, very famous, and it was painted in 1956. I will tell you more about the painting after we do the creative thinking exercise, and the reason is that I don't want to limit your ideas by telling you too much about the painting. I want you to be completely open-minded about it. And this is the best way to start. So I'm going to ask you some questions and then we will go over it together. But I would like for you to look at this painting and, and wherever you are in the world, if you have a pen and a paper nearby, to apply some careful looking. And if you could write down or notice if you don't have a pen you could just notice in your head what do you see and remember this is the part that is just the facts and i had hoped that i could see the comments um popping up but i i can't from my screen right now but i have used this painting before in a classroom um 
in a classroom exercise with our, our English language students and our graduate international students at the Northern Virginia Center of Virginia Tech. We bring them together for conversation clubs. And I actually use this painting to do, to run one of the conversation clubs. So I'm going to be quiet for maybe 30 seconds and let you look at it carefully. And then I will tell you some of the observations that the students here at Virginia Tech had about this painting. Okay, all right, so Looking at this painting, we might notice that there's a man and he's sitting in a chair. These are the facts. There's a street outside and there is something that is red and tall next to kind of between the man and the road. Uh, some of you might know what this is and some of you might not. And there's also a woman and she is looking out the window and she's appears to be looking at the man or trying to get the man's attention. These are the facts of the painting. The next step is, what does this make you think? So when you look at this painting, what do you think is going on in this painting? Can you have come up with any ideas? And again, I'll, I'll Wait a second. Some people are saying a woman <clears throat> sees something, a man is waiting for someone. Okay. We're, some people have already done the, the thinking part. That's okay, great. Okay. So a woman sees something, a man is waiting for something, he's thinking about something. Those are all good thinking points. Um, when my students did this exercise, they were thinking that the woman was leaning out the window to talk to the man and some of them thought when you could, we had the picture bigger up on a screen that she looked angry. So some people felt like, like she was angry. Um, and then um, we can see that, that maybe he's, he's waiting for someone. We discovered that at some point, I think I had to, I think one student knew what the, the red uh, vertical item was, the red and yellow item, which is an old fashioned gas pump. So there's a gas pump, he's next to the road. And so we started to think that maybe he was waiting for cars to come so he could sell them gas. Okay, so let's also look at what does it make you wonder? What do you wonder when you see this picture? What are some wondering questions that you might have? Okay, I'm gonna read some this of them through, the Facebook, line through for... Facebook. Okay, the woman maybe needs his help. What are some other things you might wonder about? Uh, the woman is sharing some ideas with the man. Okay, any other ideas? What else do you wonder? What do you wonder about? If you start this, the sentence, I wonder if, somebody give me a, I wonder if point. What if you say, I wonder if, what do you wonder about this painting? Okay, we can say, I wonder if she is calling her husband to take tea. That's one of the questions. I wonder if he's in a good mood. Good, very good. <laughs> Since pumps are self-service in the USA, why is he sitting there? That's a great question. <laughs> Very good, I'm gonna, you have great questions. I'm gonna just move along so we don't run out of time for questions. So in this case, we, we really don't know, except that I will say in 1956, I wasn't born yet then, but I happen to know that when I was a child, um, gas pumps were not self-service in the United States. So you did need to have someone. We can see that he, 
um, uh, is sitting there, he's waiting. You see the shadow behind him. I'm just pointing out some things that my students pointed out that I didn't really pay attention to and I was so impressed. The shadow, the way it's falling indicates that it might be noontime, the middle of the day. And maybe the woman is his wife and maybe she's calling him in to dinner at, or lunch, I mean. And you can see in the background, I wonder if she's angry that, yeah. And we're reading some more comments. And the other observation that I thought was amazing came from a, one group of our students. The red of the gas pump, and the red of the gas pump is reflected in the glass. And next to that is like, it looks like a fire, maybe a cooking fire. At that time, um, gas stoves were used and they, they were different than they are now, of course. And the woman is wearing a red shirt. And we were wondering if the red fire, if the artist maybe was making the point that the fire is red, the gas, which is flammable, the pump is red, and maybe the woman was of, of, a, of a passionate nature or an inflammatory nature, or if she was angry because she was wearing red. So those were amazing um, items. To help her. <laughs> That's a good one. We're still reading some of them. So that was, that was great. So I am going to go to the next, oh, no, we want to keep the picture up. So normally, okay, normally we would uh, review this list with your group and, and, and do a couple of exercises. I'm going to run through, oops, I can't get forward now. Oh, we're trying to uh, get through. Oh, there we go. Okay, no, this is good. So we did this part, we did, we will give you that. This is the information about the artist. Um, I only have three minutes, so I'm gonna rush through it, but Edward Hopper found artistic value in the commonplace. He liked to portray public places and maybe show some of the desolation, isolation, loneliness of the United States during his time period. Um, he took a lot of road trips and he painted, he's very famous for hotel scenes and for lunch counter scenes. Um, and his style is often called American scene painting. So its goal was to chronicle small town America and emphasize the divergence of American and European art. So American art, this is where it really started. So with Pat, Practical implications, implementation, we could apply this technique to a lot of different areas. And I don't know if we have time to really go through all of these. Um, Inga went through vocabulary building with you. Um, certainly you could use any part of speech, what is happening, what it, is the man waiting, is the woman cooking? And then we could even look at it in the past tense and practice again. They're saying we can go longer. Oh, okay, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> Inga just informed me that you, you're willing to go a little longer. So, okay, well, let's talk about, I talked a little bit about vocabulary building and identifying parts of speech. Maybe we could say the man is waiting. So man, is that, what part of speech is that at the lower levels? this would be useful. Oh, man is a noun. He is waiting. What is the verb tense? Present continuous. And, and this kind of thing. So it's a, it's really can be geared toward any lesson that you are currently using in your classroom. Um, does anyone, if, if you put in your comments, um, how could you use this technique for reading and writing development? Can someone send us a, um, message we're having a hard time seeing the comments on zoom we aren't seeing the comments on zoom right now but we can see them facebook. on facebook so if you're commenting on zoom i apologize because we have the the powerpoint up on on there i can't read the comments at the same time but on uh, facebook certainly we can so Oh, that's present continuous. Okay, now. Yeah, so how could you use it for reading and writing? 
how would that be helpful in your classes? If you're, if you have your class, your students looking at a piece of artwork and you need them to practice their, their writing or reading. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. You keep, keep calling in, but for reading development, you could ask them to look up an artist, pick a painting on your own, find out information about that artist, and then present it to the class either orally, or you could write a paragraph and explain, I chose this painting called Four Lane Road by Edward Hopper, and he is a, an artist, you know, and, and the, the key thing here is to make sure they're using their own words and that they are um, not plagiarizing, not copying directly, but that they are using their own words to summarize and uh, to, to inform you. Um, they're talking about using creative writing. Okay, Describing. creative writing would be great. That would be wonderful to, to write a story about the picture that you see. You could write a kind of a really interesting story. They can give vocabulary words and they use it. Okay. Summarizing the situation. Summarize the situation. Good. Creative idea. Look at all creative yeah, ideas. lots of lots of ideas. Great. And let's look at number four. So self-directed learning and independent thought. How how would this be helpful for that? We've talked about that pretty much through the whole presentation, but I'd like to hear from you on how you can use in your classroom, I don't know what level students you might have, how you would use a piece of artwork for that. So let me see, tell the students a story and they draw a picture. So flipping it, that's great. For guided writing, describe the picture, okay. So you can see that it's completely self-directed. Students sometimes want us to tell them the right answer. We'll say, what do you think about some issue. What do you think about this? Oh, what's the right, you know, and we throw out ideas and then they want to know, well, what's the right answer? Often there isn't a right answer in life. Um, it would be so helpful if there was, but usually there's not one right answer. So this is a great way to show students that you have to, what you're thinking has a lot of value and, it, and it's useful. And you will be surprised to see that even the shy students in your class or the ones who linger in the back of the room are excited. We had a young man whose English level was very limited. And uh, when I did this exercise with the conversation club, I was absolutely startled. He got so excited by it that he was almost jumping out of his chair. I, I just couldn't believe it. So. It's, it frees people, it's very freeing because of the idea that there isn't one right answer. And then critical thinking. How would you apply, think about a lesson that you've recently taught, maybe a, um, you know, a lesson that you've had experience with. How could you have used artwork in that lesson or related, remember you can pick any artwork that you want. So if you're, teaching a lesson on, uh, on history even. And, you know, you want your students to learn about the history of Great Britain because it's an English speaking country. You can go and look up paintings. There are a lot of free paintings uh, that here in the United States and available to everyone around the world. The National Gallery of Art has a whole uh, storage room online of famous paintings and you can use those paintings in your classroom. So you can choose a painting about a subject or a topic that you're teaching. How could you use that for critical thinking? How would that be useful? Give me some ideas. Nothing yet. We're waiting. At least on the Facebook. On the Facebook. We can, can't can read the other one yet. We're going to be bombarded with the um, with the Zoom questions when we when we put the uh, slideshow down and we can actually see it. So here's okay. okay. So, so we want to give them. This is um, Shazia Akar is saying to depict the situation by giving historical resources. Absolutely. And let's see. 
um, Sheikh Said Ali, I think if we gave them an opportunity to take their own artwork, okay. Tasif, recently we had arts and science exhibition and students visited the gallery and visitors demonstrated photo statistics of the resources. There's so many great ideas coming through here. So keep all of these up. Thank you. I'm gonna let you. Um, okay. Let, let me give you let me give you our contact information and then we're going to put down the PowerPoint so that we can read your questions for the Q&A. So I'm gonna turn okay. this back over to Inga for the technical so, skills. Uh, <laughs> I am not highly technical. As you can see, we're learning this as we're going. So we've so much appreciate your patience with the technical difficulties, but we are working on um, trying to see your questions on Zoom, but if you, uh, if we're not answering you on Zoom, we're not ignoring you. It's just that, unfortunately, I'm not seeing where to pull that up, but we are seeing your questions come through on, um, oh, here, let's see, Galaxy raised hand. Let's see. We are seeing your questions come through on the I Facebook thought... Live page, so uh, keep them coming there as well. We get the, maybe if we put down the... Um... Put down the. Uh... Oh, you're very welcome, Shaquille. Thank you. Thank you, all of you as well. So after watching a video, they had to write answers, Shazia. Yes, that we have lots of ideas on here that I'd like you all um, from your group. It's you know afterwards on this on this link. If these um, all these suggestions and ways of implementing are still here, please keep these to use and learn from each other. Okay. Oh, I think a we here. found. Okay. All right. So let's see here. How can critical thinking be used in mathematical teaching? Scythe, this is you. What a great question. Okay. How can it be used in math? Well, I'm going to give you a full disclosure that I am not a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so we probably need to use a math teacher because there are some subjects that unfortunately are absolute. So no matter what, one plus one will always be two. There's not a lot of critical thinking that we can incorporate there. Um, so I would probably have to say that critical thinking in a subject like math or science is probably relatively limited. Well, one, I saw an example one time. So let me just give you a, my, my side of it. I, I also was thinking exactly what Inga said. And I saw a math teacher use this um, in a video. And what she did was try to get students to figure out the next step in their math. And it was amazing. She sat them down and gave them some simple uh, multiplication problems and they had to figure out how to go about doing that and it was amazing I, I was just stunned that that you know making them figure out how can you do multiplication for example you know can you can you get a, a few uh, pebbles or something and put three groups of three pebbles and then, but they had to figure out on their own how to make it visual. And there, if you have a really great imagination and I'm not mathematically inclined either, it, it is possible to do that. Um, you have to just think about how can I, you could ask your students, how would you teach this to someone else? How would you teach them that two and two is four? How can you make it um, a visual? How can you make that a visual? <laughs> Hi, we're uh, back. We're back. Um, okay. How can you make that visual? All right. So let's see here if we have more questions coming oh, here is the, through. It might be on the chat here. I'm not sure. Let's ah, see. we found you. OK, let's uh, see these here. These were answers to, to my questions. Let me see if you asked any questions. If you if you had asked questions earlier, because we have 43 comments, if you could put your question actually on the Q&A tab and not on the chat tab, then we can see them. Even here, we could see it there where we just were. Let's 
go here. Right, but they're mixed in with all the other, oh, um, with, with the okay. answers to my So in the meantime, exercise. we're looking at the Facebook. Okay, so what do we have here? So um, Kamar Udin, um, what are some easy to use methods or ways to initiate critical thinking in language and geography class? Okay, um, once again, I'm gonna say for geography, pull out a map. Why not pull out a map, have them wonder, what would a land be like here? What would the weather be like? What do you wonder? What do you think it would be like if people who lived in uh, near the equator um, dressed a certain way, they dressed like Eskimos, if everything was upside down, what do you think about this? I mean, you can still any, um, what we're talking about right now is really just using any type of art, um, any type of visual to be able to encourage this discussion. Okay, let's see here, Shazia. Artwork, which has been done in art period can be utilized too for critical thinking. Absolutely, so if you are teaching, if we go back to Kamar's question, language geography class, we take a look at even history classes. If you're using a history class, you could put up a painting from that period in history and be able to relate that image and that painting to that period. So what was happening during that time? Um, someone earlier on the, on the Facebook group had asked, um, how do we choose the art? Which I think is a great question. Um, keep in mind, you choose the art. So depending on the level of your students, depending on the subject, depending on what you're trying to answer, what you're trying to get them to discuss, you just pick the art. So the question, um, the way I had answered the question online, uh, again, was if you have a, a English class with your beginners and maybe you're focusing on colors, well, then you may want to choose any painting, photograph, anything that's very, very colorful. Put it up and have them choose and pick everything that is red. List it. What is everything that is red? Where is everything that's green? Maybe then they can kind of go from there. So you can, based on their vocabulary, based on their level, obviously higher levels of thinking are going to be able to answer much level, much uh, higher, higher levels of language will be able to answer much more complicated questions in terms of um, the artwork itself. And I would add that we, we have had an excellent, I watched a final presentation in one of our classes, a high level class of where they put together PowerPoints, but they chose their own picture and explained why they chose it and then talked a little bit about the painting and about the artist. And usually the final presentations can be mind numbingly boring because the topics tend to be the same all the time. And this was fascinating. And I also found that the students in the class who usually you say, you know, okay, you have to ask three questions or whatever, and they reluctantly drag themselves. They were so engaged that we couldn't stop them from asking questions. We had to end, cut off the question and answer period. Like, why did you pick that painting? And I think when I look at it, I see this. And they were so engaged and so interested that it was by far the best presentation I have ever sat in on. Okay, we have a couple of questions as well that I wanna address from um, Shazia. So she's talking about, we all have this problem as well. She's talking about how you can engage, let's see here, maybe it was one person asking kind of the similar questions, but that some students are more dominating than others in the classroom is really what we're talking about. Or even Talsip is saying, what about the slow learners? How do we motivate the, the learners who maybe are not at the same level? So my suggestion for this are two things. First of all, if you, let's go first to the dominating students. So you have some who are dominating. Obviously that's gonna happen in every classroom. Everybody's gonna be at a different level. There's gonna be some students that really love this and grab, gravitate towards it and are just giving every single idea. Well, you know, that also does become a little bit of classroom management that we need to encourage, um, you know, obviously different, uh, different viewpoints, different perspectives. Um, but 
I think that when you're putting them actually one way, as Dr. Todd was showing in the practical application, is that you're putting them into groups as well. So first, they're doing this activity um, individually. So they individually are answering these questions themselves. They're writing the answers down. So domineering or not, they're able, they're all equal in that point. Um, from that point is where we break them into groups. So we have, it's almost the think pair share. So they're working first on their own. Now we have them in groups working together to, to share, well, what did you see? What did I see kind of a thing? And then finally each group is presenting to the class so that we kind of now have a more, a broader discussion. So again, the way that you can group your students will be in a way that you don't have all the domineering students together. You don't have, you know, you kind of intersperse them throughout. Um, the other part of that question from Talsif was um, the slow learners. Okay. When I was talking earlier, I think that what I find in the classroom is that um, no matter what, this technique works no matter what the level is of the student because it all comes down to the painting that you choose. So if you have students that are maybe a little less verbal, they're shy, they don't really want to, um, to engage as much, um, I would look for a painting that is very engaging in a way that's maybe more emotional, that maybe creates a very happy feeling inside of them, that you're now tapping in to their emotion rather than their thought. You're kind of taking them outside of their uh, insecurities. You know, you're removing the, the barrier and the insecurity from them because now you've tapped into the emotional piece. And so based on the emotions, I have to find that most of the time my students do, do respond in that, um, in that way. Um, wow, we have so many questions here. Let's see. Um, okay, let's see here. Let's get somebody. We can ask the group leader to give equal time. Yes, you can ask the group leader. This is also, okay, Kamara is saying we can ask the group leader to give equal time to, to the students in their group. Yes, absolutely, because guess what that does? That actually creates um, a little, uh, the group, it creates a leadership role within the group. They have to kind of manage themselves, um, decide what are their strengths. They're not all going to have the same strengths in that group. So maybe there is a leader of the group and that leader says, okay, maybe that's the dominant one who says, I want to be the one who speaks. Okay, we're going to vote for you to speak. However, I have better ideas than you do, even though I can't express them as well. So you can express my ideas. So you see, basically, then they're working together in their group to be able to pull together each of their strengths and work to their strengths so that all of a sudden their group is actually very successful in communicating their ideas. So um, they're thinking outside the box. Yes, Zafar, let's see. Girls love art more than boys. Yes, that, but that not really. That wasn't the case when we <laughs> ran these, um, when we did this with our students. The, the boys get very engaged. <clears throat> in fact, the group that I did, the conversation club was mostly men, young men. And um, they were they were really, really into it. I, I was surprised myself, but it, the other thing you can do is you can put up a painting of, of a, uh, occasionally, you know, you do it with this subject or that subject. But if uh, I saw one example where a teacher used, um, like a statue of a warrior or a painting of a um, of a fight or a you know a topic that's more uh, interesting to men. Yes, and, and along those same lines, we have a question, a couple more here from Ta um, Talsif. He's saying, what about the students who aren't interested in art? So this is not only as Dr. Todd was saying, we were the boys versus the girls. So it's not a question of being interested in art or not. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you, my background is not art. So <laughs> I, you know, if I go to the museum, I'm not one to be, I kind of walk through kind of quickly. So I'm not an artist. Um, it's not my background. However, what happens is that um, you don't have to be interested in the arts to react to a visual image. Mm -hmm. Don't use a painting then. Find a photograph. 
find something that just happened in the news, right? Find something that's in the newspaper, some image that you can put up. It doesn't have to be um, necessarily an artwork, a famous artwork, just use what they're going to be engaged in. Let's say, okay, so I'm, I don't mean to be, you know, boys, girls and all this, but let's just say your students are highly um, athletic. Okay, maybe your boy's classroom is very athletic, all of this. Well, then why don't you put up something from your cricket team? Put up a picture or a painting of, you know, the last championship that they won or the last game that they won with all the players that they love. Your students love these players. They are emotional about these players. So now you can do the exact same activity with that. You can take a look and express the emotions on their face. You can express the colors that they're, that they're wearing. What about the field? What about the temperature? How do you think they feel when they're playing the game? Are they hot? Are they not? Are they in such good shape that they're, you know, what is it? You can still do the same activity. It just depends on what you choose to focus on for your, um, you know, for the, for the artwork. Right. Okay? It's, it really is. We use the example of art, but it's a visual, any visual. As, as Inga said. All right, so let's see here. Piece of art, we're gonna give it a second talk. Okay, do you think we have to provide a, a piece of artwork rather than giving them a specific topic? Yes, I like to provide the art because still I am the teacher, so I need to have some kind of, um, you know, structure. So I personally, do like to see, you know, obviously, what am I trying to get out of this class? I'm trying to encourage critical thinking. I'm trying to enc encourage vocabulary. I'm trying to encourage verb tenses, whatever it is. So I'm going to pick the art. I'm going to put it up. And then we're going to go from there. Uh, boys take interest in politics. Yes. Why don't you put up a picture of um, Imran Khan at his last event? Put up the picture. You just had the royal family in Pakistan, put up a picture with Imran Khan and, um, and the royal family and start. Yes. Um, do you think being emotional would be helpful in critical thinking, Taos? Um, you know, you never know how it's gonna impact students. Some students are gonna feel emotion, some aren't. You might, we had, we did this exercise before actually here at a faculty meeting and we did have one of our teachers break down and cry because the, the painting became so emotional to her. So that's okay. This is fluid and natural, so it's okay. Um, have to but yes, I think we bit. are at about 9.15 and unfortunately mm -hmm. I need to teach my class. They came in at 9 a.m. and they're waiting for me. So I, um, we are gonna have to say, uh, Ron Khan is in love, I have to, um, I do have to sign off so that we can get back, but we do want to thank you again so much um, for being with us. Um, I believe that we will be sharing this or this is available, our PowerPoint, along with our contact information so that if you have any, um, if you have any other questions, I have one last one. Hold on. That just came through. Gulnara asks how to manage time when using critical thinking skills. Well, you can see we just went over by 10 minutes, so we didn't manage our time perfectly. Nope. However, we actually wanted to give you more time because you had so many great ideas. Um, however, uh, time management is just gonna be like anything else. So if your class, I don't know how long your classes are, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, um, just break it as Dr. Todd had. We can maybe have five minutes to look at the painting um, you know, five or 10 minutes to do your individual thought, five or 10 minutes for group, you know, the small group, then you bring everybody back in five or 10 minutes for discussion. Before you know it, you filled up an hour. You can see we have now filled up an hour and 10 minutes and we could keep going. <laughs> yeah. So time management, unfortunately, I think what you're going to find with your students is you're just going to have to cut it off. They're going to be so excited to be talking. And one last thing I will say before we sign off, if you, um, or when, I'm not going to say if, but when you decide to try this in your classroom, okay, be kind and patient with yourself. So if you do it the first time and it does not succeed, okay, that's okay. 
learn from your mistake, learn to see how you could do it better and try it again, okay? The first time I tried it here with my university students, um, the look they gave me, they thought I was crazy <laughs> because they're not accustomed to critical thinking and they're not accustomed to giving their own idea and they thought, why is she doing this? What in the world is she doing? Why isn't she just teaching us how to write a sentence? So sometimes you will find resistance if it's you're trying to imp, you know, have a new method or you're trying to introduce a new skill. So I'm just saying, please don't give up. Be patient with yourself. Just assess what went well and what didn't and try it again next week to see um, how, how you can basically implement it. So um, once again, on behalf thank of Dr. You. Todd and myself, thank you again so much. Have a wonderful weekend. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Please do email us with any questions or comments, um, anything else that you might have, okay? Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.